Salutations, everyone! Welcome back to Total Warhammer 3. I'm Lord Forwind, and this is the start of a series on battles. Specifically, we're going to go over the basics of various tactics, combinations, how to deploy your troops and stuff. Um, I'm hoping to continue this and do um, basic tactics for the various types of battles. You know, offensive land battles we'll cover here, defensive as well. But we'll talk in probably another video about sieges, ambushes, and minor settlements. And then at some point I'll go into some race-specific tactics because a lot of these strategies I'll cover here don't work for unique factions like the vampires who don't really have range units. So this video should be divided up into a variety of chapters. And um, you can skip to what you'd like to. Um, they're below. And if it, the video does help you, please do like, comment, subscribe. Remember, however, in comments that this is a video on basics, so unique tactics or advanced tactics we're not going to be covering, partially because if you can already do those tactics, you don't need the guide, and that would be more for race-specific videos. So let's jump right into it. So here I am using the Empire. The reason I'm using the Empire is the Empire is probably one of the most generic factions. They have everything except for monstrous units. The big difference for monstrous units, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, is they play very similar to how you play with lords or hero melee units. So um, whatever I'm doing with a lord, they're kind of the stand in here. But the Empire has everything. It has artillery, it has ranged cav, it has guns, it has heavy armored units, it's got good cav. So this is a good faction. To start with, most of these tactics here will be applicable to any other faction. So this is an offensive battle. I've set it up against the other empire. I do not know at this point where the enemy troops will be deployed on the battle. So we're not going to worry about that now. And in fact, I'm just going to grab all these units and move them back. So let's talk about deploying the units. So there's a variety of ways to deploy units in Total Warhammer 3. But let's start with the units that have to be deployed special ways. So first off, we have stuff like artillery, which has long range, but has terrible combat stats. Now, there are two main types of artillery in the game. We have cannons and mortars. So you can think of this as indirect artillery units that fire up in an arc, which mortars do, or direct artillery like cannons, which fire at an angle straight. Now, why does this matter? Well, it matters in how you put them on the terrain. Mortar units here, arcing fire units, so catapults and other rocket artillery would count, they do not need a direct straight line of fire to the enemy because they fire in an arc. Therefore, you can deploy them behind hills, behind walls, and behind your units easily, and they will still fire. This is not the same when it comes to cannon units. Cannon units are in fact affected by the terrain. So if I were to take these cannon units, and let's say, uh, we'll just grab a unit here. Let's say that this, is, this unit here is the enemy, right? If we were to take these cannon units and put them down here, they would be unable to fire up the hill. Think a modern gun. This is one thing that Total Warhammer 3 does fairly well. Guns, do, especially cannons, these type cannons, do not have the capacity to fire up at an, any level of an angle. They fire in a fairly straight line. These units, in fact, if I gave the order for the cannons to attack, they would start slowly marching up the slope here till they got to a point they could fire, and then they would start shooting. Obviously, this is a problem. So when deploying cannons or other straight line shot units, you need to be aware of where you place them. This also applies to gunner units, specifically in this case, hand gunners. They fire in a relatively straight line. They cannot fire efficiently uphill, and if you put a unit in front of them, they will either not fire, or if they do fire for some reason, they would hit your own units. So this means deploying these type of units takes special um, tactics. Now, this does not apply firing downhill, okay? So these straight shot units can in fact fire downhill at something of an angle. So if we were to deploy these troops down here, these cannon units, it's tough to approximate sometimes with the train, 
but they should be able to fire downhill and actually hit them. Um, this also applies with handgunners. They work very well going downhill as well. They don't go uphill. They don't go downhill. It can be extraordinarily difficult to figure out if a straight shot unit can in fact fire on a hill. So if we were to put these units here, right, they might be hittable by these handgunners, but the cannons might have trouble with them because they're up a hill. I don't know any easy way to tell if your units are going to be able to shoot the enemy. In fact, several battles I've played I've lost because my gunner units I thought were shooting on a straight line, but in fact, they were shooting a little bit uphill and didn't shoot. It's one of the more annoying things about the game. If anyone knows an easy way to tell if they can fire, by all means put it in the comments. So that is a very important thing to notice, especially if you're going to play a faction that uses a lot of gun units. Um, of course, some factions don't have gun units, but others like specifically the Vampire Coast are almost an entirely range-based faction with guns rather than bows. Now, bow units, similar to the indirect fire mortars, they're, they're almost in their own category here. So let's set them up in categories so it can help you just picture it in your mind. So you've got the indirect fire units, which are your archers. So in this case, we've got huntsmen. We could have archers. We could have crossbowmen. It doesn't matter. Usually they are able to fire in an arc. Same thing with mortar units, indirect artillery units. They fire up in an arc. They can fire over other units. You can freely place infantry in front of them and they'll usually shoot. Now, of course, obviously, if your infantry is tied up with another unit, your archers may not shoot, but that's a different problem. On the other hand, you have the straight shot artillery and gun units, which fire in a dead straight line. They can't fire uphill. They can't fire downhill sometimes. It can get a little weird. They're meant to fire on straight or downhill but they will not be able to fire if you put a allied unit in front of them. And in fact, it can become a real problem if the enemy engages your front line. All of a sudden, your straight shot units either have to flank or are totally useless while um, lines are fighting. For example, if we put a unit in front of our front defensive line here, the gun units and cannons would almost be entirely useless at this point as these two armies would advance towards each other and fight. So that is the difference between direct and indirect fire units. Okay, let's talk about other, some other stuff about ranged units. So now we're including ranged cav units here. And this is quite important um, because several factions have cavalry archers or gun cav. Um, they're similar to straight shots as they usually just fire in a straight line. If you've got cav archers or something, they might fire in an arch. Now, what all three of these units have in common, unlike this artillery unit here, is they have a mode called skirmish mode. Now, for most people, this is something that's on by default. I believe there's a setting to turn it off on default. But what it means, if you're unaware of this, we just got to cover it, as this unit here would get closer and closer to these cav units, they would run away to try and maintain a level of range distance. And it explains it right there. Skirmish units are particularly vulnerable to cav charges because they can't run away fast enough. Now, there is another thing to recognize about range units. And we can see the difference right be between these gunner units and these huntsmen. The huntsmen have a trait called can fire while moving. The gunners do not. This is very important for skirmishing. These guys, in fact, can also fire while moving. So what this means is as this unit would advance on these pistoliers, right? They would shoot. When they got close, they would run away. But as they ran, they would reload and shoot back at these guys, meaning Theoretically, because these are on cav units and these guys are infantry with a huge difference in speed, these pistoliers would be able to skirmish with the halberder, this unit here, indefinitely. So what that means is 
speed for skirmish units can be very important. Cav skirmish units or other uh, mounted units are very good at skirmishing. Now, this also means for the archers here, these guys have a speed of 20. These guys have a speed of... Oh, sorry, it's comparing the two. These are 30. These are 36. So what this means is as these units advance, these guys would also shoot, move, and try and shoot. Now, the speed difference means they're going to still struggle to get far away to get a good shot off, but they will pull it off. Now, these units here have skirmish, but do not have fire while moving. This means these units would advance, and these units would break and try and run away. Now, the downside is, since they can't fire while moving, they have to move to a distance that's safe, reorganize, and then turn to shoot. Whereas these guys, as they retreat, will be shooting, as will these guys. Artillery, in this case, does not have that option. You do also have missile chariots, which function almost identically to how missile cav functions. They have skirmish, they can run away, most of them can fire while moving. Fire while moving is a very powerful trait if you've got an army that involves skirmishing. For example, the Skaven are probably the best example for this. They skirmish all day long. So just be aware that units like these hand gunners have skirmish mode, but they're really bad at skirmishing. Now, why does skirmish mode matter? Let's just quick cover that while we're here. For example, we have a front line. Okay, we'll use this as an advancing unit. And we have placed our archers behind it. We'll pull these units up. Now, this is a problem that many of you may have had if you're still new to the game. As this unit gets closer, it's being shot. But at some point, it gets to your front line and these units, even though they're safe, start running away, right? That is solely due to skirmish mode. You can, so long as your front lines are going to hold, turn off skirmish mode, because it's a toggle, and they will, at that point, stay behind the line and keep shooting. Now, there can be a problem that arises if the enemy comes at you with powerful units, right? If these guys are behind here and you turn off skirmish mode and these cav units advance or monstrous units or whatever, and they just smash right through your troops, these units here on skirmish are just going to keep running away if they're on skirmish mode. Because these are cav units, they're going to keep chasing them and riding them down. And these units here will almost not get any damage off on cav. Honestly, in my experience, if your ranged skirmish units are engaged with cav, it is almost beneficial to just turn off toggle skirmish mode because they will just run away and they will do no damage. If you turn it off, at least they will fight and do a little bit of damage before they get wiped out rather than running away and getting completely wiped out. Anyway, back to our point here. Knowing when to have skirmish mode on or off is crucial. Because in this case, if Cav charged a row of spearmen, they're not, the odds are they're not going to get through the line. But if you have skirmishmen on, they will retreat for a while, reducing the amount of time they're shooting. Yes, eventually they will turn and shoot again, and they'll be a little bit safer, but you'll miss the time it takes them to move from here to here. Unless, of course, they have fire while moving. Even still, it will be slightly less effective. So turning off skirmish mode is important if you're trying to do formations. But before we get into formations, let's talk about the other option here, which is fire at will. Fire at will is something you should usually leave on. Um, the AI in particular, um, it doesn't make a huge difference. Now, human players, they will sometimes send forward trash units to draw the fire of your ranged units and artillery run out of ammunition, then they'll send their good units in when they can't get hit. That is the case where you may want to turn off fire at will. Usually you want it on though, especially versus the AI, who are usually too stupid to send in trash units first. Since we're here, let's talk about the other buttons on the bottom here. So this button right here is withdraw. They try and run away. If they escape, they will be reused in another battle. This is not a common button to be used except sometimes on artillery units or like 
um, high level units that have been fighting for a while. For example, a cav unit that's like max experience, but has been fighting so long they only have like two units left out of 60. That's when you want to get them out of the battle and you might have them withdraw. In the case of artillery, like these mortar units, their melee combat stats are so bad. Um, they're some of the worst in the game. It, it would make sense at that point to have them withdraw from the battlefield once they're either their mortars are destroyed or they run out and spend all their ammunition. At that point, they're almost useless. Might as well withdraw them and not risk losing them because then they'll be in your next battle. Now, be aware, of course, if you withdraw units and then your army is destroyed, yeah, you've got problems with withdrawal. Now, the next buttons here, and there are a variety of them because there are some unique ones for artillery and there's some in sieges. There's a button here for drop artillery or siege engines. If you press it in combat, your units will disengage from whatever they're interacting with and they will become a normal unit. Now, at that point, you can also re-click on the engine or the cannon and they will get back on it and shoot again. So it's not a permanent decision. Reasons you might drop it, um, if you're trying to retreat artillery behind your line, for example, and they're just so slow and enemy cav is bearing down on them, have them drop it and retreat and there's, the mortars are unlikely to be destroyed by the cav units and it might give you a chance to save the actual unit so they can get back to the artillery later. The other option is if they are routed, they will drop their artillery or siege engines and run away, at which point you might have to right click on them to get them to pick it up again. So let's get back to other buttons. So if we were to pick Spearman and an Archer unit, highlighting them at once, there is formations. So this, they will try to stay in these formations. I don't tend to use these that much, but they can be quite quick and handy ways to do it. So if you put them in a formation, they become in a group and you can then command them from there. You can set it with a melee front, range front. I believe there's even some stuff where you involve cav, but I could be wrong. I don't use it that much. Yeah, for example, that's kind of how it does it. it puts the melee units, then the cav, then the archers, then the artillery. Or if we flip it around, puts the archers, cav, melee, and then siege artillery. If you incorporate lords and heroes, they get used as well. Um, honestly, you can do this without commanding them. But if you want, you can do that. It's kind of cool that if you grab them, put them in a formation, they go in a group. At which point you might have to take them out of a group. So the next one here is guard mode. This is hold your position basically if you've played rts games most of them have a hold your position basically your unit will stay in an area it will only fight enemies in close areas and if the enemy runs away they won't chase them this is more important on defense than per se it is on offense because usually on offense you want to overrun the enemy whereas on defense you tend to want to hold your line so what that might mean is if we sent these cav units here, right, and we're charging towards these infantry, and as the Spearman player, we give an order to attack the cav, right? So these advance a bit. Now, if the cav all of a sudden engages or loses and runs away, these guys would keep chasing them, correct? Now, if we don't have the move and we don't give an attack order, but we put guard mode on, these guys charge in, fight, lose, and start running away. These guys will stay exactly where they are. This is a button that's very important for front lines so that the front lines don't get disrupted, especially if you give attack orders or moves and stuff. The other benefit from this, and this is something I didn't know. Um, I have to trust the people who have told me it because it seems to be working. For missile units, if you put them on guard mode, only the units in the close quarters with the melee units will switch into melee mode. The ones behind it will still try and shoot. Um, from what I understand, it works very well on wall battles um, because it will allow like the front line as the enemies are pouring over your walls to actually fight, whereas the ones behind it are still shooting. It's a little bit hard to tell how effective it is, but it is a thing, as far as I'm aware, that is productive to use. Okay, moving on. Groups. So 
There are several ways to create groups. You bring them here, you can either hit the hotkey to toggle them into a group um, or something. You can also do like control keys, um, which if you play RTSs, you might be familiar with using control keys. You can put them into it, but taking them out requires you to hit a button. The cool thing is if I assign this um, to a group, and then at any point I want to select that group, it's a group labeled one, I can hit one and it will move to it. It's a great way on the battlefield to swap between units. If you ever watch me fight battles, I almost always take my cav units and stick them in a group because usually they're out fighting on their own away from the main battle, flanking, and being able to just click on them and grab them is amazing. Otherwise, I have to sometimes search through here to find them, and then I have to click, shift click to highlight multiple at once, and it takes a long time to be able to um, select the correct units. Also, if for some reason I was using a combination of cav units, like a ranged cav and shock, putting them in a group makes a huge difference. Otherwise, one's over here, two is over here. For that, I'd have to do control clicks to highlight them. If I hit a shift click, for example, it'd highlight everything. Using groups is definitely something you want to get good at if you're expecting to do well in battles can even be productive to assign your lords or your mages to groups so that for some if you need to jump to them quickly like they're taking damage or it's time to cast a spell you don't have to search through the bar or on the battlefield you just click on them technically i can double click but it's easier to use number keys to jump to them okay so that was the major stuff so let's just hit up on a couple other minor ones here so the next one is halt if you hit backspace they will stop now that be aware the down says it will disable fire at will. So if your unit is charging forward and you want them to stop immediately, you don't have to click on them and then give them a, a movement order to get them to stop. You hit backspace, they should stop as dead as can be. The downside is sometimes you will turn off fire at will and not notice that. So be aware of that. It can be a problem. The next one here is... Um, it varies depending on your unit. If you're a melee unit, they're always in melee mode. If they're a ranged unit, you can in fact toggle them into melee mode where they will attempt to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's usually not a great idea because ranged units particularly suck at melee combat. Dwarven, archer, crossbowmen are a bit of an exception in that, in my mind. But if for some reason you have ranged units here and they're fighting artillery the artillery 90 percent of the time is going to win a ranged battle with archers at which point for the archers swapping into melee mode and charging in they have better combat stats surprisingly if you look on the left there than the mortars do at which point it becomes beneficial to fight in melee combat otherwise try to avoid it but it's good there's a button previously it was a bit weird you had to hold on like an alt key and medieval total war 2 or something and the last one here is a very crucial one this is how fast your units are moving so if you give a movement order your units will start running towards the target usually now that's fine if they're charging the downside is as they run they're going to use up their vigor um, their stamina basically and if they use up all their stamina they will fight less, they will move slower, they will have more problems in combat. You want to try and keep their stamina slash vigor up as high as you can. Now, units like Cav do fine running around the battlefield, but if you're making your infantry unit sprint, say from here to there, they're going to be exhausted by the time they get there. Walking them is usually the right move. It's a walk at one speed or walk at two speed tells you they'll tire faster if they move quicker now be aware marching does not give them the charge bonus for that you really need to double click on the enemy or make them move quickly at which point you will get the charge bonus now why would you want to shift around with this well say i've got infantry or cav units and we're approaching um artillery or range units backed up by spearmen okay so as this unit gets closer, it's under fire, correct? If it's walking, it's going to be on fire a lot less of a time than if I suddenly, once I'm in range, charge into the infantry. 
Remember, archers and ranged units don't fire particularly well when your units are engaged in melee combat with an enemy unit. Some of them can arch over it, but a lot of others won't be able to shoot accurately. Therefore, if I charge as this cav unit into these spearmen, obviously that would be stupid because they are charge defense. But if we had some basic non spearman unit here and we charged in these units here despite being stronger and fighting they would be under less range fire while they're in combat so if you start getting under range fire that's when you want to make sure you're probably running otherwise you're going to take a ton of damage cav in particular their run speed is absolutely nuts it's how you do flanks, it's how you do charges, it's how you even do withdrawals. You can skirmish extraordinarily well with cav. Infantry, on the other hand, is slower, and it becomes a problem, but certain, um, certain infantry units are faster. So usually your melee units tend to be slower than your missiles. There are some exceptions, which means using your melee units... Um, it's hard to withdraw while under fire, but your archers can sometimes maneuver while under fire, and they're also better at skirmishing. Now, one other thing that needs to be talked about is in group, there is a button up here, which is toggle group lock. They will try to preserve the relative positions and facing of their units. From the point at which the game was created, you can alter it in game settings, as it explains. Why does this matter? Well, if I grab these units and I put them in a formation like this, they will, assuming with a group lock, they will attempt to maintain that position while I move them around the map. Which is quite important because if I want to maintain a formation while advancing, either range in front, infantry behind, locking them will help that. Unlocking them will allow me to move it around. Uh, it can be very useful if we have um, ungrouped and we say let's add some others to this group and stick them in a formation melee front if i want to just deploy them elsewhere they will not deploy in a straight line but if i turn off group lock well actually i created this with a formation so they'll naturally try and get to that um, but sometimes if you grab units you just grab them and draw them somewhere they will form um, weird lineups this will try and preserve that group setup other times it will not uh, it's very important if you've got your archers in front melee behind because it tends to default to infantry in front archers behind um, so if you do it the other way archers in front um, melee behind it might behoove you to use that advanced players use it more um, often than beginners just be aware it exists now, there's a couple other things to be aware of. Um, I'm sorry, we're going through all the basics here. Over here on the left, there is this unit details button. This allows you to see your units and the enemy units rather than just, oh, there's those units. You want to see their details, if they've got any special effects, what's their experience, how they rank against another unit. That's where the green is positive, red is negative here. These cav units have a much better, um, more health. But their combat stats are, um, sorry, they have less health than the melee units, but their combat stats are better. Now, it doesn't mean they'll win, but it gives you a nice um, perspective to see the enemy army. Once you can see them, obviously, you can quick scan over them and learn details, comparisons. For spell users, you can see the spells, any special effects. You can also see morale and stuff. It's quite handy. Now there's another button I can't show you at the moment until we get into combat, but it, it's over here. Um, I think it's over here. There's a button that allows you to take control of artillery units and fire them on your own. Firing them on your own, if you're accurate and practice, can be much more beneficial letting the, than letting the AI fire on their own because the AI kind of sucks um, at shooting. <laughs> Mortars in particular tend to miss more often than not. If you take command, you can do more damage. On the other hand, you're neglecting the rest of the battle while you're controlling your artillery. I should probably cover this. Um, over here, you've got your winds of magic, how much magic you have, what the reserve is, what the recharge is. Once you cast a spell, it will slowly recharge from your reserve. If you run out of reserve, usually you have no magic left on the battlefield. You've got your mage. It will tell you various spells. 
If you double click on a spell that allows for upcasting, you'll cast a higher level spell, cost more magic, but usually be more effective. You'll only see this when you actually click on units that have spells. If you click on a unit that doesn't have spells, you just have the base one. If a unit has abilities, it appears on the left here. Most of these, except for ones with numbers, recharge over time, so you can click on them multiple times. Up top here, in case you didn't know it, is the allied and enemy troop count. You want to see how many troops your enemy has versus you. It's a way to go. Be aware the bar of power here tends to be a more accurate reflect of how hard the battle will be for you than the number of troops. Um, factions that have a lot of lords or powerful single entities will have less units, but their bar of power here, green is you, red is your enemy, will show that. This is the timer of the battle. If you've got a timer, Depending if you're the attacker or defender, one side might win if time runs out. A lot of times, time doesn't run out. In this case, I would lose if I don't beat the enemy in 60 minutes. All this up here, it's relatively pointless. Here's your various speeds. You can also go into a tactical map if you're a fighter who likes to commit. person who doesn't necessarily like to see the actual units on the battlefield. You can control them all from above. It's a little bit easier than trying to get up above here, because once you do, you immediately go into the tactical map. But it does allow you to save an entire battlefield, particularly good at hunting down either running units or watching for flanks. A lot harder to actually maneuver your units here, because it's hard to see if units start to overlap. You have to click that to get out. Okay, I think we've covered all the basics now, and we've covered a lot of basics. So let's quick go over a offensive battle here because we have a battle to fight. And so we'll talk quickly about some of the strategies and then I'll try and implement them. So the first strategy and one of the most basic ones is I am the attacker, meaning I have to attack. If I was defending, it'd be easier. And we'll talk about that probably with the same map and units after I go over offense, but most of you like to attack. So let's quick organize our armies. I'm gonna group up my cav so I know where they are. Just make sure I have a rough idea. These are not gonna be my final deployments here. I just wanna know where everything is, relatively speaking. So some of these units here, um, my halibarders, halberdiers, spearmen, and swordsmen tend to be my melee line. At least for the advance, I might group them up just so I can click on them and move them up faster. Doesn't mean they're going, they'll all move to one target, so I'll have to manage it later. But for advancing, it's not a bad idea to have them grouped. Similar thing for some of my range units. This should actually be in this group. Oops, mess that up. There we go. Usually artillery, you can either group it or do it otherwise. Be aware that once a battle starts, artillery moves really slowly. So if you can, you tend to want to put artillery in its final position at the start of the battle rather than at the end. So because we have a straight shot artillery unit, we want to put it on a hill. Ideally, putting it down in a valley would be stupid unless they have to come through the valley because it won't be able to shoot up the hills on either side. So looking at our side here, this hill right here is probably our highest point. Um, we could either put them here, have the most fire possible, or we could deploy them at a slightly lower hill and be able to push further and shoot further into their territory. This, of course, is the area of fire. Now, obviously, I'm still going to have trouble with that hill, but it might be worth to put it there so I get the most possible fire range. Mortars, on the other hand, I can put almost anywhere. So because I'm attacking, I want the artillery by and large in range to fire at the start of the battle rather than having to wait for it advance. It also will help if the enemy has artillery or range of their own. Um, I don't want to spend time marching my troops up there. So I'm going to try and deploy my troops pretty close to the battle. If you've got units with Vanguard deployment, and we do, you could deploy them a lot closer to the enemy and start a battle there. On the other hand, this is a range unit, so if they have any cav, it would just die. But if we had a cav unit or an infantry unit with um, Vanguard deployment, we could deploy them elsewhere. Oh, um, before we get any further, I should talk a little bit more about some of the train here. Obviously, most people know what hills do. You're slower going up a hill, faster going down. 
but there are obviously impassable terrain here. You can't shoot through them. You can't move through them. There are terrain like this water, which in this case we can't go into. Sometimes you can go into shallow water. Um, shallow water makes it harder for small units, infantry, to move through. Not so big an impact for monstrous units, lords, or cav. Then over here we have the woods. Um, woods are important because if you deploy units in them and the enemy can't see them, they will become invisible uh, right here, or hidden rather. Until the enemy gets close, nothing will happen. So this would allow a flank. I can deploy these units all the way up here. The enemy is going to spawn here. All of a sudden I've got units on this side. Might be worth doing. On the other hand, this is pistoliers, which are not the strongest unit for flanking, but they're good for skirmishing. So I could wait till battles engaged, charge them out, take out artillery or flank and shoot. Similar thing I could be done with these huntsmen. On the other hand, the huntsmen have stock, so they're hidden wherever I put them. So I could put them right out here in the open. And unless the enemy gets close enough to see them, they would have no idea they are there. I'm not going to do that with these guys because they're also my main archers. Anyway, explaining all of that. There's also walls and stuff, but we're not going to cover ter those terrains in this battle. So let's think about our attack. We've got artillery set up so that it will fire on the enemy. I might move this up a little bit more. I'm going to immediately move troops to protect it. But for now, that should work. We've got war chariots and pistoliers. So I'm actually not going to flank with the pistoliers. I'm going to combine it with my other um, fast moving range unit for um, range flanks and stuff. Cav is set up. Infantry is set up. Whoops, actually, it's not fully set up, is it? Now it's fully set up. I've got my ranged archers, which are going to be in one group. I've got my ranged handgunners, which are in another group. And I've already got my lords set up as well. So the enemy is there. They're probably not going to advance on us. They might if they don't have artillery. And we, otherwise, we'll just sit back and pound them from a distance. Um, that's definitely a tactic you want to be aware of. If the enemy has no long range, and you do, make sure you use your long range before you engage um, closer. Because you'll get more kills without losing units. Obviously, that doesn't fully apply if you have a very short time limit. So... We're probably going to do a pretty basic advance for this battle, since it's not meant to be a very uh, advanced guide. So we can't put the hand gunners behind it, or they can't shoot unless there's a hill. And right now, they still couldn't fire there because it's not a big enough difference. So we're going to put Cav on the flank. It's probably over here because it's got the longest and hardest terrain to cover. Cav is great at that. We'll probably put our range skirmish units over here. And we'll probably move our hand gunners to here. If we can, we'll try and put them up on a hill where we can shoot down. We'll keep our huntsmen behind our lines to start, although we'll probably move them forward sooner. We'll keep these units close in case the enemy deploys right here and charges. Um, our lord... Unless it's an absolute frontline tank, which Franz at level 1 is not, we would probably deploy behind our troops, put the mages, I find, usually in the middle. Be aware, of course, lords and heroes have this nice blue circle. This is their area of influence. You want units, ideally, in their area of influence because it will give, assuming you've got red line traits from the campaign, tends to give leadership and other bonuses. Sometimes range fire, faster reload exists. Now I've actually made a mistake here. Right now those cannons are going to have trouble firing because of my melee units. So let's spread that out a little bit. Because we're on offense, we have to advance basically. It's unfortunate. It's usually easier to play on defense than it is on offense, but offense has the advantage because they get to determine how the battle is fought. So we've got several different strategies here. Our first one is we could just do a nice charge up the middle with all our melee units, and that might work, but it may not. We're probably better trying to pound them with our artillery, wait till they either have to respond, and then see where they're deploying. Meanwhile, we'll flank with our cav and range units to get a position on them. There are several different tactics for a battle. And I'm going to start this battle, finally, after 40 minutes, 
and then we'll see where the enemy is deployed, and then we'll talk about ways to break them. Okay, so here we can now see the enemy. So the enemy has arguably a better army than me, so this is going to be tough. Um, they have deployed their anti-cav units on their flanks to a large degree. They've got very powerful units. They have a steam tank, which is kind of a knockoff artillery unit. They actually have a flying unit, which is going to be a bit of a pain. Um, and they've got a couple skirmish magic missile chariots and stuff, which are just going to be able to shoot me. So I can't just sit back and hit them forever, even though I do hold an advantage. So this is actually a half decent lineup from the AI. It's not great because they don't have a lot of range units, and I do. The downside is if it gets into melee, I'm probably going to lose the battle because they have more stronger melee units. So what we want to avoid is any combat against units that can win. There's a tactic called, um, I can never remember what it's called, um, a pincer move. Basically, it dates back all the way to stuff like Alexander the Great was notorious for using it. Basically, you assume your front line of infantry is going to hold the middle and you try and win the flanks, and then <clears throat> then you encircle them, as in, uh, let's see if I can set this up. So I would try to, therefore, move my units around the sides, flank, and hit them from uh, behind. Or, if I'm lucky, I get back here, and I take out their artillery. So as you can see, that would be the path. By the way, I'm holding down Shift if you don't know how to make and set up multiple orders. This is how you do it. You can create some really weird messes. <laughs> It basically tells you units go one place, then take the next command. You can even use it to set up attacks. So that is a very basic tactic. Win the flanks, then crush the middle. Because attacking from behind in the sides, the enemy receives morale penalties and gets hit more. Now, another tactic that we could do, and um, might not actually be a bad one here, would be to charge the middle. Um, if we were to deploy our troops... Oops, I can't redeploy because we started the battle. If I was to charge up here and attack the dead center, their troops would try and swing in from the flanks to surround me. But if I'm strong enough, I can break right through their front lines and then push onto one flank and smash that flank before turning around to deal with the remaining troops. It's basically cutting off units, killing them, and then using numerical superiority to crush the remainder of the troops. Isolated units don't tend to do very well in combat, it, both real life and in the game. So you don't want to fight off on your own. Exceptions tend to be cav and lords who send, tend to be capable of dealing with um, single units on their own. Or even multiple in the case of cav versus uh, archers. Now there's plenty of moves we that more advanced you could do, like charge in, shoot, try to withdraw to force them to chase you. But we're not going to go into it. So... Basic tactics here, win the flanks, usually with cav or strong units, or even range units, then attack from the sides or the front. Being aware, of course, that units that have shields, that say shielded unit here, will resist shots from the front. They will not resist it from the sides. So if you flank and shoot them, they will die quite quickly. Meaning front on collisions between units getting bombarded with arrows is not super effective uh, it varies a bit if you're using guns um, a lot of those are armor piercing so you can flank take the sides you can charge through the middle you can try and cut off units you can also decide to sacrifice trash units in this case our biggest trash unit here is probably the swordsman they're cheap generic they don't tend to do a lot of damage they're usually tier one units whereas tier two or tier three units are a lot more valuable Send this against their strongest units and hope they live long enough that your strong units smash their strong units. It's all about establishing supremacy at different locations. Oh, I should also mention, if you click on a unit, it will then show what units are considered to be a threat to it. So right now, if we're on the cav units, the handgunners and this magical chariot are considered to be low threats along with the wizard, meaning if in melee combat, we will probably win. Now, on the other hand, if we click on this unit here, you'll see the anti-cav units are vulnerable, aren't to cav. That is letting us know we probably don't want to charge cav 
into um, units that are anti-gaff. So it gives you a rough idea. So for the artillery, almost everything is not a threat except other artillery units. Although I would still be wary of the calf. So why don't we execute a plan here and we'll see how it works out. So what we've already found out is this plan here to flank and shoot on the sides is probably not going to happen because they have cav here. Unless we are to send our cav units over there to fight their cav, we're probably not going to win on that flank. Also, we're definitely not going to win with a war chariot, which moves much slower than their demigriffs. So I'm going to actually disband this group. Now, the pistoliers will be able to skirmish successfully with the demigriffs. The downside is demigriffs have high armor. These guys are weak against armor. But it is a way to distract and pull off the demigriffs. So I may, in fact, try to do that. These guys, I'm going to move back towards the middle. Uh, I'm not going to send up the gunners there. So we're going to probably at the moment, depends if they're going to advance on me. But anyway, I'm going to pull those back. Um, I'm going to take my great cannons here, which have long range. And I am actually going to try and get them, ideally, to shoot the steam tank here. They're considered an anti-large unit, which means they're better versus that. Whereas your mortar here is anti-infantry because it's an explosion. I'm going to send it on probably the great swords. Meanwhile, our cav over here is faster um, than their units. So I can safely advance on this flank. No one can get across the water here. So that gives me a good idea that I'm not going to get flanked from there. Uh, we've got our wizard. I could advance and hit magic, but I don't want to risk a charge from their very powerful cav. Let's see what they're going to do. A lot of battle is reacting to the enemy. Okay, so they are moving a bit. Let's see what they're, where and how are they moving. As you can see, the cannon is attempting to hit their steam tank. Didn't do very well there. The mortar is dropping its attacks in. Hey, we actually had some hits. Pretty nice damage. Huge morale damage to those halibard units. Halbadiers, I guess you could say. So these guys here, I think I might have them shoot. They're probably not going to do anything. As you can see, they've responded to me sending my cav units out by deploying their cav. Their cav is anti-large, mine's anti-infantry. I'm probably not going to win that fight. That's fine. I don't need to win that fight. Right now, we have the advantage in the sense that even though they're able and quite capable of attacking me, um, which they are, ow, um, we have better artillery at the moment, so I'm probably just going to keep blasting away at the moment. Wait till I either see an advantage or disadvantage. Okay, so now something else has happened. My skirmish cav here has actually drawn a charge from their demigriffs, which is both good and bad. In fact, my hand gunners are in fact able to fire up that slight incline. Um, it's not a steep one, which helps. These guys are charging in. Now, what does that mean? It means they are vulnerable. They are out of position. They have nothing here that can come help them. The downside is, of course, they can run away. So I may, we'll see if I can do it, try and draw, focus fire on them for the moment. Archers, gunners, everything I got will go at this guy temporarily in the attempt to kill off one of their stronger units. And look at the melt. This, If this was a human player, this is a bad decision. You don't want this to happen to you. Worse, they've now charged them into our halberdiers, which are going to absolutely wreck demigriffs in combat. It still says we have a disadvantage. I would say we just had a huge advantage. The enemy just hit us with a spell, which is a little bit annoying. Um, but these guys are going to die. Also, they have charged into my cav on this flank, where currently I am winning, but in the long run, I'm not going to. So what I'm going to do here is charge out, charge in, and try and flank. Hopefully, we can get an um, advantage. Otherwise, we're going to lose on this side, and we're already losing. So that is not good. 
On the other hand, we have absolutely wrecked them. On the other hand, look at this. All my troops are now massively out of position from where they were. So I'm going to actually pull them back. Send up my skirmish guy. Call back my lord. Now that we know that their cav is defeated, we can actually try and deploy our gunners on the flanks. They should be able to shoot up that slight incline. We're not going to have our uh, huntsmen keep pursuing. In fact, since huntsmen have skirmish, I'm going to march them forward a bit. I need to be very careful about this here since we're losing on that flank. These units probably both dead, as I was afraid of. Range unit here. I don't believe they're in range of any of my spells yet. So I'm going to advance just a little bit. We got to make sure that we don't let our artillery get hit. So in fact, I'm going to grab my whole front line here. And be aware, I'm not deploying this ideally. And change it so that my artillery and my range units will be guarded. Um, checking, of course, to where my units will deploy. Okay, let's see how this goes. They are charging in because I'm winning the artillery battle. They almost have to advance at this point. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep bombarding them from range. Now, problem is my cab is just getting wrecked. So if I can, I'm going to try and withdraw. Sometimes spam clicking like this gives them a better chance of getting out. Because otherwise, once they're in combat, they might start. My pistoliers here, light cav skirmish unit, just got absolutely wrecked by their huntsmen. So I don't want that to happen. I would prefer if I can wreck their huntsmen. Their steam tank has been killing our units, but has taken decent damage. Our mortars are not, annoyingly, uh, actually getting that many kills. The enemy, on the other hand, is about to advance into range of my guns. Hopefully they can shoot. If not, I'll have to move them. Uh, yes, they are going to be able to shoot. Okay. Now, this is where if we have any abilities to activate to strengthen our units or range units, we might be casting them. Um, we do have the ability to drop a Thunderbolt on them. It has a cast time of several seconds. So we've got to be aware where we drop it, um, especially because the AIs are actually half decent about dodging in this game. So let's try it there. We'll unpause. They're advancing. Are we going to get it off? Four, three, two, one. We got a hit off. Did decent damage. We got 21 kills out of that. Their halberdiers are getting wrecked. They, in fact, have managed to catch the cav here. This is why I need to keep spamming move on them. I'm actually going to pull my lord over here in case he's needed to defend my artillery. Okay. My huntsmen are shooting their ranged units. We're not winning at the moment. I tried to give them an almost equal army to mine. Um, the AI picked slightly uh, well-rounded well units. Now we're getting close to actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. I'm actually going to pull a spearman unit over there. Hopefully that can tie them up. Okay. So my cannons are still trying to finish off theirs. They have gone and taken their flying unit, and they are charging right at my lord. Which makes sense. They're trying to kill it. Actually, they... Actually, nope. They're not going for my lord at the moment. Oh, they are. There we go. So, we've also seen the retreat here coming in from the huntsmen, who are totally... who are routing, in fact. I think the other ones died, which isn't good. These guys here pretty much won. We've lost, and we're losing this battle considerably. As you notice, we've lost 400. They've lost 200. A lot of that's here on the flanks. Um... Hopefully, once battle actually joins, we might be able, might be more effective, but we'll find out, won't we? So the enemy is charging in, which is fine. Now, they haven't engaged my full front line here. So what I'm actually going to do is advance with these guys and then try and flank them. Franz here is fighting for his life, not doing particularly well, so I'm going to buff him using some of his abilities. I'll also buff his um, people around him. My mage is here, so we need to get another spell off. We could try and drop some of these giant meteors on them, which I think I will do. Now, if we drop them too early, they will just try and dodge, which is a big thing with players. So we want to ideally drop them in an area where they are engaged. We're going to upcast it too. 
try and do as much damage as we can. And we're going to drop it right there. That should get quite a few kills. Okay, so they just absolutely wrecked my mortars. And unfortunately, since my cav is lost, I have no real way to engage their range units outside of blasting away with mine. Um, these guys right now are useless, so I'm going to advance on the flank. Gunners, ironically, are a flanking unit. You want to use a fair amount. Um, it's just how it works out. These guys are shooting away. Bronze is winning, so that's good. My poor archer here is just getting annihilated, or mage is getting annihilated. My front line is dying. So what we want to do is we now want to start firing on these guys, hopefully before they get some fires off. Yeah, there we go. We're getting some nice flanking coming in. Okay, front line's holding there. Franz won there. I'm going to throw him into combat. My spearmen are doing the best they can, which isn't much. So in my experience, the way it works out is archers beat gunners, gunners beat everything else, <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. Uh, gunners are particularly good against melee units, but not good against others. Oh, my mage rallied. Good. Okay, let's see what we can do with him. We could probably drop uh, thunderbolts on him. and We're almost out of magic. These guys regrouped, so I want to advance and get them shooting again. They're casting spells, which is unfortunate, but I can't do anything about it. Okay, we've won on the flanks, actually. Our gunners got a good enough flank off that we've routed most of theirs. It routes chain, so when one unit routes, it causes units nearby to start to route and continuously down the line. That's why flanks are so important. We're starting to narrow the gap between us. It's not going great, but it could go a lot worse. We have a magic missile spell. I'm going to try and cast if we can. So my gunner's won. My main line has won. We're going to swing onto these guys. We also routed their lord, so we got that advantage going. Trying to shoot them as much as we can. You shoot there, you shoot there. They're running here. We don't now that they're running, we don't want them to stop running because we're flanking them. Uh, my spearmen actually did pretty well versus their cav, which is what I was hoping. We are actually, as of now, winning the battle for the moment. So I need to turn off Skirmish here because they won't advance while that guy's right there. Okay, we've won on this side. So let's see what units we can get to go there. We also can't for neglect these guys or they may rally. Um, Franz is probably going to die, unfortunately. So let's buff what we can till he dies. Okay, so my spearmen finally lost on the flank, so let's grab a couple of my other units here, send them against the cav. Okay, we've routed him. Some of their units are trying to regroup. These guys won't regroup while I'm killing them, so that's something to be a part of. Got a problem here that these two units are in fact starting to flank each other. So I gotta deal with that problem. Also, they can't fire up that hill, which is an issue. So now we're in position. We've pretty much smashed them. It's just a matter of finishing them off. So that is an area effect that hopefully should hit them. Yep. And just like that, they're shattered. Shattered means they won't come back. My gunners are finally routing. Some of their units are regrouping. We're trying to kill them off on the flank. These guys got flanked by the cav, which is unfortunate. 
those guys are getting crushed, and we won the battle. So even though things went bad, the tactics mattered. So to recap, our flanking ability didn't work, but if we had had the same cav units they did, we might have been able to win and smash behind. As it is, we tied up two of their most powerful units, fighting two of ours, which were powerful, and it was a sad loss. But then we tied them up even further with this one brave, cheap Spearman unit, showing that, as all tactic people throughout history would tell you, you don't send cav into spears. Meanwhile, our gunners actually were the MVPs of that battle there. That flank that routed their entire ranged core just changed the entire combat. Our cannons killed one of their strongest units just from range and got a few others. Our poor mage who ran away got a lot. Franz killed the enemy lord. And our front line held. It didn't win on its own, but it held. It needed help. And our other units helped as well. So let's end the battle and we'll see the exact kills here. So as you see, the wizard alone got 116 kills. That is how powerful wizards are. There on the other hand got 44. So it's very powerful. Overall, their cav was way more effective than the use of mine, but my gunners turned out to be way more effective than theirs. My range units, archers, proved not to be as effective because they got obliterated. But overall, it was a pretty even fight. So what I did was I pulled them in. As they hit my front line, I collapsed on them. You remember my flank on the left there with the great swords? That caused a chain of me being able to win on one side. Meanwhile, my center actually won, surprisingly. And then I folded around to the right flank to wipe them out. That is very common. You should never really have units sitting idle in battle unless they're fending off an enemy. So those are some basic offense. So we'll take a look at defense in a moment. Okay, we're here on the same map. This time we're on the defensive side. So I've swapped our races now to be the green skins on one side, dwarves on the other. And I tried to keep most of the units uh, pretty basic. So you get the idea of what it might look like um, in a battle early game. So we have the choice of where we wish to defend in this battle. So we have a couple choices. The, they are going to come to us and they have a lot of calf. So the dwarves do not have cavalry. However, we do have dwarven warriors who have a charge defense against calves. So that's not the hugest issue or the biggest issue for us. It's a matter of trying to figure out where we want to engage. And there are several options and they all take advantage of this pretty well-designed terrain map. So what we could do is we could try and fight along the lake here. Since no one can cross the lake, this is basically an impenetrable defense. So what we could do is, similar to what it set us up to do, is just hold, try and put the entire battle to take place between these two rocks. The downside is that's using up almost our entire army, so we wouldn't have any protection against flanks. We could also decide to try and fight on this side where they're going to have trouble seeing us over the hill. The downside is there's no defenses here. So in fact, we're probably going to set up over here and take advantage of a very narrow approach along the left side of the lake, or they'll have to walk around this way. We have two artillery units. So let's figure out where we want to put those. We want them in range of either the enemy or in range of their advance but we don't want it set up in range of their artillery. So their artillery is reaching to here. So we want to make sure when we set up, we're out of range. So our artillery gets shots on them before their artillery gets in range. So in fact, we're going to adopt a strategy that was a, um, a very common one in um, Rome Total War. It's pretty much called the Flanax in the Corner strategy. It is a annoyingly hard defensive strategy to beat. So we, I will show you what that is and how you use it. Basically, it takes advantage of this, the edge of the map. No unit can go outside of it. So what that means is if you're standing, if you put a unit right here in this corner, right? pretend there's a unit here, it can only be attacked from the front and from the right side. The left and rear are safe, meaning it's very defensive. On the downside is, if your unit routes at all, it will very quickly leave the map and you will lose it. It works 
if you can hold the front lines. If you can't hold the front lines, it's a dangerous strategy. So let's deploy to try and do that. So we're going to try and deploy enough troops here that if they come this way, we will tie them up. So I'd say we're going to need at least four units here, all stretched out to hold. Because we got to remember, we got to hold all the way up to there. So it's a long way to defend. So let me just compare the distance here. Okay. So four units there should be enough. We've got all these quarreler units. So we'll deploy them here. In fact, I'm, yeah, this should work. I'm a little bit wary of some of this. So we're going to do that there. We're actually going to stagger this here, and eventually we're going to move some units up to hold there. So, in fact, let's grab these units here. And we're going to do something like this. We're going to create a front line of archers, or a front line of melee with archers behind, making sure we turn off skirmish mode. Otherwise, as soon as they advance, our archers will get pushed into this corner and be in total disarray. We're going to save two dwarf units here to cover this flank. In fact, we're going to move the whole army back a little bit. Oops, wrong unit. Here, I'll get it set up and then we'll jump back to this. Okay, we're back. So this is what we've ended up as a defensive strategy. So we're kind of in the corner. We're not fully in the corner and we'll try and adapt to that. We're still risking a flank, but it could be a lot worse. So what would happen is, as these guys advance, we'd try to fold to the corner here, probably actually pull most of these units back a bit more, saving our strong units here, hammerers and slayers, which are our damage dealers, to actually fight the enemy uh, as they get closer. We don't want them to bear the initial charge, because neither of them have anti-charge defense. Having units that have charge defense, usually spearmen, sometimes other units, are the best frontliners because it means cav can't just easily disrupt your front lines. So that is a very tough strategy, and I almost guarantee if we fought the battle at this position, we would win um, just because of how strong the dwarves are in defense. But let's say you don't choose this position. How would else could we set it up? Well, if we wanted to, we could do the initial strategy we had here, which is to defend this choke point here. Choke points are important because a choke point is where the enemy is forced to come to you, whereas if they had superior numbers, they are not going to have the advantage. So right now, if they charge, they have no way to flank us easily. They have to go either around the lake or around this rock to flank us, which I can then try and deal with. So we could try this strategy, which means we're going to set up pretty similar to really how we did. And we will pretty much get the try to engage and smash their artillery ideally before we focus fire on their other units. That is another potential strategy. We'll, we deploy other units on the flanks to try and hold off any calf. On the other hand, we don't have enough. There's really no great way to stop their flank because they have a lot of calf. Therefore, we have to anticipate a flank. So another strategy is an on the land in the wide open phalanx type strategy that is this so if we deploy our units here we create a, what we want to do is create a relatively narrow front right about here oops that's too many units i only wanted three but three there so now we've got some for the flanks so we put two or so here in fact we're going to make this even narrower by stacking our range units so yes, they will not all be able to fire at once. But what this means is now we can form basically a square pike and shot formation, which was a thing on the battlefields of Europe. It is a very tough formation to break because in order to break it, you have to charge into people who are basically waiting for you to charge into them. So we're going to take our flamethrowers here, which are quite powerful, stick them right in the middle take these guys station them here the biggest danger of this strategy and this is a very solid defensive one is that you overlay your range units so they actually can't shoot another for another variation on this which you should be aware of is actually deploying some of your range units at an angle 
the reason you might want to do this is if the enemy sends cav and the archers are all focused forward, they won't shoot stuff on the flanks. So we just want to be aware of that. So I'm going to deploy these guys to shoot any cav. Obviously, we have a hole at the back, which we're going to plug with our remaining troops. Unfortunately, we don't have too many we can deploy in the back that are anti-cav, so we'll just have to risk it. So if the enemy was going to break this formation, our weakest point is right here in the back because we don't have anti-charge. If they were smart, they would ignore the front of our formation, bombard us with range and maybe monsters units, send the cav around and try and get a flank off and smash through our slayers and hammers. Obviously, probably not going to happen because slayers and hammers are ridiculously hard to kill, but it would be a viable strategy. Another variation might be to spread out these wings here, create long, wide flanks. I, uh, this is almost like if you look at um, uh, 1800s, 1900 forts, they had um, outposts or um, ramparts that spiked, uh, I can never remember, ravelons, I think they are called where they would put artillery at a point to try and fire as much as you could and if you advanced on that artillery point you would then get fired on from other angles this is another uh, variation of that where we basically try and narrow our front our dwarf units are better one-on-one -on -one than their orc boars so we can bet that our front line is not going to be smashed we also could vary this by putting our hammerers in the front line they are pretty much not going to get killed so what we could do is we could swap these two formations here. So then we'd have something resembling this. This is another one. So we've put a flamethrower unit, short range power in the front so it can do its damage. I'm gonna turn off skirmish. And this is another formation we would be looking at as well. Might actually be better than our original one. You gotta play around with it and test it. But this is a very viable strategy as well. These slayer units, unfortunately, we don't have a really good spot for them. So I'm gonna change it dwarf armies are arguably the most defensive armies in the game kislev is the other close one so this is what we're looking like so if you want if you saw a dwarf player doing this you do not want to charge into this ideally you want to break them from a distance lots of range could help siege artillery is particularly good so let's give this a try we also have Grom Brindle here, our lord, who's very powerful. Making sure, of course, all our range units do not have skirmish on, because that could kill us. Actually, I should... So their artillery is just out of range. So they're having to advance. So this is ideal. As you can see, we already got some nice kills coming in on their um, front line, or at least damage coming down. They're just going to start shooting us from a distance, which is a problem, because they're going to be hitting our good units. But we have really no choice but to suffer some damage. If you're going to be a defensive one, the more siege weapons, the better. Because otherwise, that happens. They just start blasting you from a distance. Thankfully, dwarves have magic resist, so hitting them with spells is not really the solution. Uh, I don't know why these guys aren't firing, so let's double refresh that. <sighs> this is a problem. Our iron drakes are getting clobbered. Ugh. So this is the downside of not having um, the ability to flank. You're stuck at the mercy of whoever brings siege weapons. Siege weapons change entire battles. And now we're going to start to see the benefit of this. We've basically created a hedgehog almost formation. No matter where they go, they're going to get shot. And if they charge anywhere, they're going to get stabbed. Hedgehog porcupine formations are a real thing. See, because the AI was under fire, they've decided, well, we're not going to stay under fire, we'll charge in. Which is exactly what I was hoping for. No human player would be this stupid, by the way. Unless they're really new to the game. And in fact, they stopped because they realized they were charging in. They're going for our weak point here, it looks like. But in the meantime, they're taking tons of fire. The damage is mounting. They're going to charge in against units that are anti-charge. And it's just not going to go well. 
our dwarf units are barely suffering casualties at this point. And except for our front line, which is a waste of units because our hammers are some of our strongest units. Unfortunately, they had artillery. This is why I would not have deployed them normally in the front line. I would have put them on the flanks. And just like that, their cav is getting driven off. Even though the cav is getting driven off, we're not going to change our formation at any point here. Because as soon as we change the formation, a lot of these cav are going to re-rally at some point. We'd expose ourselves. A good defensive formation has to hold even after it is under attack. I don't know why these guys weren't shooting the whole time. Now they are. So... They have charged in. I can see their lord. He's vulnerable. They've got monstrous units, which as you can see are wrecking our units. Their cav is rallying. This is probably their last charge of their cav. So I can start to move my troops to the front line. They're not charging there, which means I can pull these guys up. Brindle is charging in. And I sent him right up against the enemy war boss. Some of my units are not in combat, so I need to shift those around. So we gotta fold around the flanks. Flanking is key. If you can flank, you can win battles. If you can't flank, you've got problems. I wish I knew why my artillery was not firing constantly, but it isn't. We'll we still probably win this. The downside is they were fighting hammerers, which even though they are losing to the trolls, they're still very powerful. So now the AI has done a smart move. When their cav has rallied, I exposed my flanks to reinforce the center because that was getting smashed by trolls, which was a good move by the AI. They now have the vulnerability to charge into my artillery, which sucks. Now, if this was anyone else, I'd be very worried, but Dwarven Quarrelers and artillery are actually some of the best in the game at melee combat, which is hilarious. So these Slayers are the only fast units Dwarves have. So ideally, if I can, I want them to flank or rather charge at the enemy. And even though these guys got a nice flank on the cannons, they did not manage to route them. These guys dropped it, as you can see by that icon. So we're going to click again, rally up, keep going. I've turned my artillery. Actually, I should turn my artillery onto theirs at this point. They are on skirmish mode, so they're just going to keep running away, which is hilarious because that's exactly the wrong thing to do in this situation. This guy has rallied just with 8 health. I love it. Uh-oh. That was a Mork spell. Ow. Thankfully, dwarves are tanky. Otherwise, we would have lost a lot of units there, probably. No, no. Don't come back. Keep moving. We want to attack. You'll notice my archers are still kind of holding the formation they're in. Mainly because I'm using them to try and kill off the routing cav. Their cav was actually quite a problem. Even though it didn't get a lot of kills, which is a thing, it disrupted my formations at times, forced me into a position that wasn't ideal. That is a very good strategy in games, is to force your enemy to do what you want them to do rather than what they want to do. Like, I didn't want to have to leave the formation, but because, look at their artillery here, it's got 140 kills. I have to move out of this defensive position, which has its own problems. So all these guys should be attacking, but I guess they're not. 
There we go. Army loses. So despite them having more troops, and despite my unit's informations being shattered at times, it was an easy defensive battle. That is very common to the dwarves. Attacking is arguably a lot harder unless you come with either range, artillery, or magic supremacy. It's hard to win on pure combat, which is why factions like Vampires and Chaos um, factions have entirely different styles of play, which I should be able to cover in another video. So to recap, we had several different formations we went over and then we saw a battle. So you could see some of those tactics in implementation. Cav flanks are very powerful, as you could see in the first battle where their cavalry caused immense havoc to my units. You notice they didn't charge straight at my lines, which were anti-cav uh, lines. They instead came around the flanks. And if they had managed to get around the flanks sooner, I sacrificed my cav to slow them down. They could have wrecked my artillery and my gunners before I even um, got my gunners off for that amazing flank. On the other side, their cav unit chasing my pistoliers in the first battle into my army where they immediately got shredded by anti-cav in range was a dumb move. The initial charge was good, but as soon as my units fled back towards my lines, it was a dumb move to chase. And they weren't taking any damage from my pistoliers, so it was a sacrifice of a powerful unit for nothing. Think chess. It'd be like giving up your queen to get a pawn. Afterwards, the charge in the middle... Our front line held our flanks. We moved around and circled his units from the sides and behinds, as well as getting a great flank off of our gunners. Even if our gunners hadn't got the flank off, we might have been able to pull out a victory because his gunners couldn't shoot through the backs of his own troops, making them almost useless once we got into that close combat. His hunters, on the other hand, were getting arching over and doing damage, but they were shooting in a straight line into units that had shields, which were blocking. That was very useful in the first battle. In the second battle, we saw the power of several different formations. The turtle in the corner move, turtle on the side holding a choke point. If that had been a narrower pass in the middle, we would have held it, and we'd have probably even lost fewer units. And then we also saw the power of being building almost a fort, a circular fort out of our units, where we put our artillery in the middle, surrounded by range, lords and mages if we had had a mage in the middle then we put anti-cav on the noticeably front flanks where they were likely to charge which is usually from the side we turned our archers so that cav got shot the weakness to cav is archers the weakness to archers is cav if cav can get to them and then we held with our front line and as soon as we noticed the enemy was not attacking our flanks anymore we folded around if they had a stronger cav, that would have been a disaster, but I knew that our artillery and even our archers could resist already half-dead cav. And then after that, we just made sure to keep shooting retreating units as they were routing to hopefully get them to shattered, which is where they cannot rejoin the battle and rally. And at that point, we started a chain route. If they had managed to rally some of the units, they probably could have fought against us, but since I kept chasing them, if I had had cav, I would have wrecked them even harder. We kept them from being able to rally, and so we chained the route as one routing unit made the next unit start to route or lose morale and then route, thereby down the line. So those archers, the reason they fled, first off, they were archers. They don't have great morale anyway, but because all their retreating infantryman was running into them, they suffered a huge morale penalty and thereby routed it. Routing is key. If you can ruin an enemy's morale, as soon as they route, they're no longer effective in combat, meaning any unit engaged with them at that time will start basically just killing them at will. It's only if they can get far enough away from combat or a spell effect wears off or our artillery effect wears off, they might rally and do damage. Shattering is ideal, but it's hard to get to. Constantly causing routes is amazing. There are certain factions that rally from routes, which you got to be aware of, but I will cover those in race-specific guides. So that will be it for this battle. If you have any questions on them or other tactics you might have that are effective, leave them below in the comments. Let me know what you thought. Like, subscribe, all that great stuff. Look forward to some um, guides on siege battles, minor settlement battles, ambush battles, and then hopefully we'll get into specific race battles. Not going to get into full army cops, but we'll cover some of those as well. Anyway, thank you guys all for watching. Bye for now.